Genesis 45 and verse 1, then Joseph says the authorized version could not refrain himself before all of them that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near unto me, I pray you. And they came near. And he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. It's got to be the greatest statement in the whole story, that one. It was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son, Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt. Come down unto me, tarry not, and thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me, thou and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast, and there will I nourish thee. For yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy household, and all that thou hast, come to poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin, that is in my mouth, that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen. And ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them. And after that, his brethren talked with him. And the fame thereof was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brethren are come, and it pleased Pharaoh well and his servants. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, Say to your brethren this do ye, bid your beasts, and go get you into the land of Canaan, and take your father and your households, and come unto me, and I will give you the good land of Egypt, and ye shall eat the fat of the land. Now thou art commanded this do ye, take you wagons out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives, and bring your father and come. Also regard not your stuff, for the good of all the land of Egypt is yours. And the children of Israel did so. And Joseph gave them wagons according to the commandment of Pharaoh, and gave them provision for the way. And to all of them he gave each man changes of raiment. Uh, but to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver, five changes of raiment. To his father he sent after this manner, Ten donkeys laden with the good things of Egypt, ten she donkeys laden with uh, corn and bread and meat for his father by the way. So he sent his brethren away, and they departed. And he said unto them, See that ye fall not out by the way. Don't quarrel by the way. And they went out of the land of Egypt, came into the land of Canaan, unto Jacob their father, and told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. Can you imagine that? And he is governor over the land of Egypt. And the translation is, Jacob fainted. No wonder. He fainted, for he believed them not. And they told him all. Now, notice that. They told him all the words of Joseph, 
what he had said unto them. And when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob their father revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I'll go and see him before I die. And Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, Here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make thee, make of thee a great nation. And I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will also surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father, and their little ones, their wives, and the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry them. They took their cattle and their goods, which they had begot, uh, gotten in the land of Canaan, and came into Egypt. And Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons with him, and his daughters and his sons' daughters, and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. And of course, verse 28, he sent Judah before him unto Joseph, to direct his face into Goshen. And they came into the land of Goshen. And Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good while. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die since I have seen thy face because thou art yet alive. And Joseph said unto his brethren to his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren in my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle. And they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have, and it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you and shall say, What is your occupation? Now remember, to the Egyptians, shepherds were an abomination. You say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth even until now, both we and also our fathers, that we may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. So he wasn't afraid to declare what they did. Then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, my father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan, and behold, they're in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men, and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto him, Thy servants are shepherds. Oh, I love that. Both we and also our fathers. And they said moreover unto Pharaoh, For the sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants of no pastures for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying, Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen let them dwell. And if thou knowest any men of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. And uh, Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old art thou? Quite an inquisitive character, wasn't he? How old are you? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and all his father's household with bread according to their families. Thank you. For listening to the reading of the Word of God. Now, I've read the whole sweep of it tonight because I want you to get it clear in your head first, the ground we're covering, so as I can pick out of it the salient points that the Holy Spirit would have for us tonight. Now, Joseph's first task is to prove to his brothers that he really is Joseph. And that's not easy. Remember, 22 years 
have passed. Twenty-two long years have passed since they saw him. And he wants to reveal to them who he is. And his second task is not only to prove to them that, to them that he is Joseph, but he wants to prove to them that he for, has forgiven them totally. Of course, that's exactly what the Lord wants to do for you. He wants to show you who he is. You, whoever you are, and to me. It is his desire to reveal to you himself. Now, in a particular way, and throughout eternity in his glory. All that Christ is, he wants to reveal to every man and woman who's here tonight. And in a very real sense, whenever you repent of your sin and you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you are converted, that's what happens to you when you get converted. You discover, you discover that you have a great need for Christ, but then you discover that you have a great Christ for your need. Yes, many of you throughout these weeks, quite a few of you have been trusting Christ and many over the months, and that's tremendous. Sitting in these services, you have discovered you have a great need for Christ. But my blessed be God, through these services, the Holy Spirit has been working powerfully, and some of you have discovered not only do you have a great need for Christ, but you have a great Christ for your need. But then you have discovered that the great maker of the will is alive to carry out his intentions. And you have found out that he is not only the Son of God who is mighty to save, but that he is the Son of Man who is mighty to feel. He can Feel your infirmities, your hurts, your heartaches, your burdens, your trials, your difficulties. He feels it and knows it. He's not a high priest who cannot but be touched by the feelings of what you're going through. We're not talking about a sect or a denomination or a list of rules. We're talking about a mighty living Lord who is not only mighty to save but mighty to feel your needs. Bear your sorrows and carry your grief. Doesn't send you to Mecca. Doesn't give you a shot in the arm of morphine. Doesn't get you to take heroin like poor Miss Shannon last week at Oxford. How very sad that was. And millions like her. No. Doesn't move you into some little religious trip that will last for a little while. He stands as the great Savior of eternity, and he cries to our world, whoever you be, whatever your situation, wherever you come from, little boys and girls, teenagers, men and women, in every strata of society right throughout it, Christ comes and says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Come, he says, to me. Just come to me, and I'll give it to you. The IRA had burnt out the business of a little friend of mine, or a friend of mine, his little business. He was frightened. He was in the pubs drinking. He came one night to a service. He said, I'm not going home until I am saved, by that he meant, until I'm converted. I want to know Christ personally. A lot of people talk to him, and I'm not telling this story to draw attention to myself. God knows my heart. They said, you go and talk to him. I said, fellas, you, I said in my heart, you fellas have talked to him for a long time. I, maybe I'll not really be able to help him. But I thought, here goes, Lord. So I went in, and I said, well, after a little while, after explaining the way of salvation, I got down on my knees beside him. 
And I said, we'll pray. Lord, I said, here is a man who's got a whole lot of burdens. He's frightened of his very life. Scared of dying. Sick of living. As the Negro spiritual says. You know, he was sick of the life he was living and he was scared of dying. Maybe that's where you are tonight. And I said, Lord, here he is. And he desperately needs rest. And you said, if anybody would come to you, you'd give it to them. And I quoted that verse I've just quoted to you now. And he jumped up. Never forget it. He jumped clean up. He said, I'm saved. And you know, preachers, they tell folk that they can come to know Christ personally and get peace. And then when they tell them that they have come to Christ personally and have got peace, they doubt them. Say, have you really? <laughs> Is that true? I have a friend, he's a doctor, you know, I'm always saying that, but he's a tremendous character and he's played a great influence in my life. And he told me, what, 40 years ago, as a young student or whatever, he was listening to a preacher who was talking a lot about the Lord's coming. And oh, he was a powerful preacher in the pulpit. But when my friend got him around the fire at home, he discovered he didn't really believe the Lord was coming. Not really. Preached it. But he didn't really live as if the Lord was coming. Talk is cheap. To teach others to do good is good, but it's no trouble in comparison with doing it. I looked at him, I said, uh, in a sense, I said to him, if I remember, have you? He said, yes. He said, didn't you say that the word says that if I come to Christ, he'll give me peace and rest? Well, he said, I've just come and I've just got it and I'm saved. And away he went, almost like that, out and about and out into his life. In these last 10 years, he's lived to prove it. I wonder, are you like that tonight? It's as simple and as powerful as that. Come, says Christ, to me. Why, said the great Spurgeon after he preached one night, don't come to me, go to him. I don't want you to join anything tonight. I'm not here to try and get you to join anything. I'm not here to push you and cajole you and catcall other people. I am here, and we are here by the grace of God to preach Christ and Him crucified. For that's what the country needs. And that's what I need. And that's what you need. And that's what we all need. We need Him. Him. What is He? He's got power to sanctify. There is more power to sanctify and more power to elevate and more power to strengthen and more cheer in that little word, Jesus, than in all the utterances of man since the world began. You take every novel that Jeffrey Archer has written, every novel that Tolstoy wrote, everything Dickens did, every film director out of Hollywood or whatever, you take the whole lot of them together, and all the plays, and all the great politicians, and all the philosophers, and all the great army leaders, Napoleon, Alexander the Great, Charlemagne, you go through them all. Put them all together. And there is more power to sanctify, to elevate, to strengthen, and to cheer in the word Jesus than in the utterances of the whole lot of them put together. I believe that. I believe that. Jesus. There is something about that name. Savior, Master, what a, what a Lord. He was an example in his life showing us how to live. In his death, he was a sacrifice satisfying, uh, uh, satisfying to meet the needs of our sins. And in his resurrection, he's a conqueror. And in his ascension, he's a king. And in his intercession for the believer, he's a high priest. He is not only the great, he is the only. Why, said H.G. Wells, who wasn't known as an evangelical as far as I know, he said Christ is the most unique person in history. 
No man can write a history of the human race without giving first and foremost place to the penniless teacher from Nazareth. You ever been to Nazareth? It's worth a visit. Worth a visit down the main street of the old city. Wonderfully narrows your mind. As I walked through it, I said, Lord, if I wanted to start to influence the world, this is the last place I'd choose. As the open sewer run down past the wee building where I was preaching in the old city. Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth, said Nathaniel when he heard of Christ. Can there? Before long, he was bowing at his feet and the story repeating and the lover of sinners adoring. H.C. Wells was right. And you know what Napoleon said? He said, between Jesus and whomsoever else in the world there is, there's no possible comparison. And he was also right. Oh, that by the Spirit tonight, the beauty of this lovely Savior. I mean, after all, friends, after all, what else is there? Hmm? What else is there? I think I mentioned to you last week, I was in a home where there was a, a lot of trouble recently, a lot of sorrow, terrible, terrible, terrible sorrow of the worst kind. And we all sat there, and it was a crisis in the family there in that situation, and it was in another town, and my heart was breaking, and so was everybody else's, and we all sat down, and what did we do? Did we watch TV? Not, not a minute. Did we lift our favorite journals and have a read through them, see what the leaders in the papers said, or what was happening in politics today? Not a word. Did we criticize other people and other churches and other groups, them and us? Not a word. What did we do? Never forget it. For about an hour, I can see it yet, one took out a wee, wee hymn book and said, look, Derek, you see this here? This man said, see us here? This is my favorite. All the way my Savior leads me, what have I to fear beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my guide? Divinest comfort in thee I see. And on through the hymn that I can't finish, but it's so beautiful and that we know so well and we'll be singing next week at our special songs of praise service. Somebody else began to tell a verse. Somebody else shared an experience, and just for an hour we talked about him. What else is there? When all your money's gone, and all your influence is gone, and all your status symbols are rubbish, and all the world's fashion is past, what is there? There is only one who is unchangeable who is majestic, who will live in the power of an endless life in a position of glory that no one can ever ascribe to or it be shared with. His name is Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's him we present, it's him we preach. And to the world, huh, they say he's another man. To us, he is our very life. And he's alive. Prove him tonight. Prove him in your life. Prove him in your office. Prove him in your home. Prove him on your farm. Prove him in your college. Let me prove him in this pulpit and in my own family life. Let's prove him. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so there will not be room enough to contain it. Is it any wonder the preacher gets excited when he preaches Christ? And here is Joseph trying to prove to these men that he's now the Lord of Egypt and trying to tell them to go home to their dad to tell him about his glory in Egypt. And he's having great difficulty in trying to get these fellows to believe him. He has to repeat it. They don't believe him at the beginning, and his father certainly didn't at the beginning when he heard it. And a whole lot of you folk here tonight, and me the same often, we don't really believe him, our lovely Lord when he makes his lovely promises and says he can do what he can do. Why, says verse 3 of chapter 45, it says that they were troubled at his presence. Troubled at his presence. They had sinned against him, and yet he was alive. And the world took our Savior and crucified him on the cross, and now he's alive, the one we've sinned against. 
See the shades of God here in the life of Joseph? What a type he is. It's unbelievable almost. And if you had told that Joseph's brothers that Joseph was alive and that Joseph had totally forgiven them for the dastardly things they had done and that God was behind everything that had happened over the previous 22 years, not one of them in their wildest fantasies would have conceived such a thought. But it was true. And that's what conversion is, you know. Because when you come to know Christ and he reveals himself to you in salvation and then you grow in your Christian life and you begin to mature in your Christian life and it gets better and better and better and better and wider and greater. And what I'm finding is all the joy of teaching this book, all the wealth of truth in it, all the Christ that we are presenting, he is a fountain, a well of life that springs up forever. Oh, the wells of his salvation, who can describe them? Oh, the joy of knowing him. Oh, to have him in your life and see him work circumstances in your life. It's fantastic. It's not an old dead religion. Sure, religion is only man's search for God. But as we say often, the gospel is God's search for man, and there's a difference. And when people trust the Savior for themselves, and then they start to live for him, they suddenly discover that it's more than they ever dreamed of, that he has forgiven me, that he is alive, and that he's going to bless me in a better land ahead. Now, same with Joseph. But you see, Joseph not only wanted to prove to these men that he was Joseph and says it twice in this passage, he couldn't refrain himself and cried uh, and so on and said, I'm Joseph in verse 3, but then in verse 4, he has to come again and say, come near, come near, will you come near to me? I pray you, I am Joseph, your brother, please, you know, that's who I am. But I want to prove something more to you. I want to prove to you I have forgiven you. I've forgiven you. Don't be grieved nor angry with yourselves, verse 5, that you sold me hither. For God did send me before to preserve life. Now, what's this? Well, Christ wants to do the same for us. He wants to tell us that if we've trusted him for salvation, that even our very past has been overruled by God and worked together for good. And although good never comes out of evil, God has worked despite the evil in our lives. I was thinking much about this for this meeting. Absolutely nothing can be more emancipating than the truth, sir, that you have been forgiven. There is not a person listening to me now, and not an individual in this building or watching by video, but doesn't have skeletons in their cupboard of some kind that rattle their bones now and again and say, ha ha, I'm going to get you one day. And they're all going to know what you did or you said. We have all done things, me included, that we are absolutely and thoroughly ashamed of. And if only we could get that situation back again, we would not do as we did. But it haunts you, doesn't it? Say, so, yeah. why did I do it? What a stupid idiot I was. I knew it was wrong, yet I did it. And it haunts you. But if suddenly you could see that it's not just a lot of evangelical claptrap and preachers talking and pulpits just for the sake of talking, but that it's true that the God who made you and against whom you and I have sinned in Christ can forgive us because of Calvary's work and the blood that Christ shed. And if we receive Christ as our Savior, that God can reveal to us that even when we were wrong in the things that we did and even the things that we have done wrong since we have trusted him, that he can overrule it. And not only overrule it, but right forgiven over it. And although it was evil, and good doesn't come out of evil, he can work in spite of the evil and make all things work together for good to them that love God. You say, oh, that's cuckoo land. It's not, my friend. That is exactly what Joseph said to these men. You sold me, didn't you? Yes, you did, verse 5 but God was sending me before you to preserve life and prosperity in the earth. And it wasn't you that sent me hither, but God. Ooh, that's fantastic. 
Hey, and all I'm sure Joseph didn't really think that when they chucked him in the well and he's lying down there and there's no water, as I often said or, or said when we were going through it, you know. Do you think the fellas leaned over the pit and said, Hey, Joseph, you know, we hit you, but the Lord's in this thing. You'll be all right, son. Huh? And then when he's standing on that block and being sold as a slave, somebody stands up at the back and says, It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're going to be sold as a slave. The Lord's in it, son. You're okay. Everything's going to be all right. That's okay as a theological point. But what's it like in the nitty-gritty of life? Yet that's what Joseph is saying. You put me in that pit. You sold me to the Ishmaelites. I came down here, and God was in the whole thing. And all I can say is, as that lovely hymn we've quoted already tonight says, my Jesus hath done all things well. When my feet made haste to hell, there should I have gone, but thou dost all things well. See tonight, if you're in this meeting, the preserving hand of God. Even when you're way out, friend, even when you're a rebel, even when you can't have any time for it, and you'd rather have Dallas or Dynasty than the Word, when you'd rather have immorality and sin than the fidelity of marriage, when you would rather have pornography than the purity of the Word, let me be real, when your tongue is being filled with filth and dirt and blasphemy, the love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It reaches to the highest star, and praise God, it reaches to the lowest hell. That's why C.T. Studd said, I don't want to live within the sound of church or chapel bell. I want to build a rescue shop within a yard of hell. And went to the heathen of the world to reach them for Christ. Isn't it fantastic? Yes, you, you know, you meant it for evil, says the Bible, but God meant it for good. And that's emancipating. What I'm talking about, friends, is total forgiveness. You say, look, mister, there ain't no such thing as total forgiveness. And I want to say to you, there is. You say, no, no, it's not possible. You can't be totally forgiven. You can now, millions would stand up against me tonight and say, it's not possible to know that you are absolutely forgiven. But see this story. What is absolute forgiveness? Well, notice what he did in verse 1. He put them all out. Whenever he wanted to reveal himself to his brothers, he said, cause every man to go out from me. And he wants to show them that he has forgiven them. And the first thing he did to prove to them that he had forgiven them was put everybody out. That is, all the Egyptians. Now, what did he do that for? Judah finishes his speech. Joseph breaks down and weeps. Cries his heart out until the Egyptians and the whole house of, of Pharaoh hears it. And now when he composes himself again, he says, cause every man to go out from me. Why did he reveal himself to his brothers in secret? I'll tell you why he did it. He didn't want the Egyptians to know the bunch of hoodlums they were because that's what they were. Didn't want the Egyptians to know what his brothers had done to him. He wanted his brothers to come and live in Egypt, but he didn't want his brothers to get off to a bad start in Egypt. Can you imagine? You know, there are a lot of gossips around, you know. Even the walls have ears. You find that the older you grow. You think those Egyptian servants standing around wouldn't say to the wife when they went home or whatever, do you know what I heard today, dear? See, see the governor, do you know what happened? His brothers arrived, and I heard the whole story. Those boys, they sold him and threw him in a pit and all the rest of it, and Joseph forgives them. Wow, it would be at the other end of Egypt before very long, wouldn't it? And then when those people would come to live, they'd all dig each other and say, oh, there's Judah there. He's the one who suggested that instead of putting him in the pit, they'd sell him as a slave. Those poor fellows would have been the brunt of all sorts of uh, insinuations. The Egyptians would certainly have hissed at them. So Joseph said, everybody out. That's a lovely thing to do, you know. You see, an unforgiving spirit, if you don't forgive somebody for what they've done about you, you want to let the whole world know how you hurt. See that, see that fella there? See what he did to me? See that girl there? See what she did? See what they said? You want to let the whole world know. And the more know, the more jumping with joy you are. Terrific. They all know now 
how I'm hurting. Ah, but love hides a multitude of sins, the Bible says. Hate wants to let the cat out of the bag. Here's what so-and-so did to me. But absolute forgiveness is when you protect the one that you forgive. So Joseph sent everybody out. Is this not what the Lord does for the believer when he says in his word, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more? Now, what does that mean? Does it mean that God uh, doesn't realize they're there? Of course he does. He actually doesn't only say, I'm going to forget their iniquities. He says, I'm going to refuse to remember their iniquities. And everybody knows, don't they, Corrie Ten Boom, that lovely, lovely Dutch Christian how she put it so beautifully. God has put my sins in the sea of his forgetfulness and has put a little sign up on the boy that floats on the top and on the boy it says, no fishing allowed. Yeah, isn't it true? You know how that we take a promise of God and we put it like a plant into the ground and we plant it and cover it up and say, that's it. Yes, it'll come to fruition one day. And then we dig it up every morning to see how it's getting on. How you going on, little plant? Would you hurry up and grow? It's like our sins. Jesus says, your sins and your iniquities I will remember no more. We say, no, 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 Lord. What about that night? And what about that day? And what about this word? And what about this? And what about that? Yes. Absolute forgiveness wants to make a person feel completely at ease. Notice that, that Joseph's brothers were troubled at his presence. They couldn't answer him. They couldn't say a word to him according to Scripture. Verse 3, his brethren couldn't answer him. They were dumbfounded. They couldn't say a thing. They were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said, come here. Come near to me. And this is not Jimmy Cricket calling. Shut the door and come here. That's a lot deeper than that, isn't it? Come near to me. Come here. It's not another joke I have. It's not just a bit of crack we're going to have around this particular place or this palace. Look, come here. The door is shut and come here. I want to tell you, he is saying, I have forgiven you, fellas. It's all over. I have no bitterness. I'm not going to hold it against you, and I don't want anybody to know about it. My, the thing's fantastic. He wanted them to be at ease in his presence. And there isn't the slightest word of reproach uttered as Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. Boy, if that had been you and me, and say, see, I got you guys now. Right? See what you did to me when I was a wee lad? Yes, that would be our translation of it. I'm going to get you now. Not a word of it. He had the chance. He had the power. He had the authorities behind him. He could have thrown those fellas out. Not a word of it. My, what, how like the Lord he is. Come near to me, I pray you. Come near, but it me, I said, come here and shut the door there a minute till I give you something you deserve for what you did to me. He wanted them not to be afraid. There wasn't the slightest word of reproach as he revealed himself to his brothers. I want them to feel uneasy. Hate wants to make the other person feel uneasy. Hate wants the other person to feel uncomfortable. Hate wants to make them squirm. And a second time he says, I'm Joseph, your brother. He was the same Joseph, wasn't he? Yeah, but not really. And in another sense, he was very different, wasn't he? He was different from the lad that was cast into the pit. Those years had made their mark on him. The depth of experience from those long trials had altered him and altered his circumstances. And I see something now in Joseph, a fantastically deep understanding not only of the nature of God, but the nature of human beings. This fellow was a very intelligent man. He knew what made people tick because he's, he knew how these men were going to react to him when he wanted to absolutely forgive them. He knew their immediate reaction was going to make them feel awful. Huh, Joseph, hey, can I get out that door? Let's beat it, lads. Come near. You'd rather put Egypt... Uh, you know, the Mediterranean between you and Joseph, if you'd been caught like that. So that's why he says in verse number five, it's a lovely word, isn't it? He says, don't be grieved and don't be angry with yourselves. 
You see, how do people tend to forgive? Well, if you do something on somebody and they forgive you, they say, well, yes, okay, I'll forgive you. But I hope you realize what you've done now. Hope you realize what you've done. But when you really love a person and you want to forgive them, then you want to make them feel good. You see, Joseph got right under the skin of his brothers. He was a very intelligent man. That's a good thing to know, you know, study human nature. Study it. It's a rare thing. Keep your eyes open. Learn how people react so that you don't say those things that will bring the worst out in them. But perhaps a word of warning or admonition from a heart of love will help them. But understand what's behind it all. How they tick. I, I, I love his understanding of the human psyche that God had given him, of course. Don't be grieved. Don't be angry with yourselves. He made it easy for them to forgive themselves. He was saying behind all that has happened, a sovereign God is looking after you. It was not you that sent me hither, but God. And that gave them a sense of dignity and a sense of worth and a sense of saving face and a way of coping and a way of looking forward to the future. See, it's one thing to say that God forgives, but it's another thing to forgive yourself. That's what I find. Yes, thank you, Lord. I'm so glad that you died at Calvary for my sin. I'm delighted, Lord, that that blood can cleanse me from sin, and I trust you as my Savior. But I can't forgive myself for what I did. Many and many a fellow has thrown himself off a bridge, and many a girl put her head in an oven or taken an overdose because they couldn't forgive themselves for what they did and said. And the fact that God had forgiven them wasn't enough for them because there are a lot of people walking around who claim to have God forgiving them all of their sins, and yet they're not living in the present. They're living in the past, ridden by guilt. Oh, to you I want to talk tonight because there are millions of you really, you know. This is but a microcosm of what's out there because as face answers to face and water, so the heart of man to man, what God is saying is that not only can he forgive you through this story, but he's saying that you can learn to forgive yourself and you can come to see that his hand was with you even at your worst moment. And absolute forgiveness shows God's sovereign plan in everything and that you're not just a, a living by instinct and whatever, that there's a God who has a plan behind your life. Notice that total forgiveness involves teaching these men how to forgive themselves. Now, now, don't sit there, fellas, and be grieved at yourselves. Don't sit there and be grieved. I know how you feel. Don't be angry with yourselves. Don't be grieved. Come near unto me. It's lovely, isn't it? But notice that total forgiveness is demonstrated when you keep someone's sin hidden from the person who means most to him. What did the ten brothers fear most of all? Well, I would think at the start they were certainly scared of Joseph. But the thing, as Kendall points out in his book, that they were scared most of all was Jacob. And I would say that that's true. What if dad finds out? I remember one day going up a road with a fellow in a car. I'll never forget it. He was driving in the middle of the road. You know, it was a wee country lane, but he was in the middle of the road. And this young bucko came over the hill very fast and uh, crashed into us along the side, ripped up the car. And I thought, dear me, what's going to happen now? This fellow who was driving got out of the car and he looked at the young fellow. He says, uh, he says, uh, uh, have you been driving long? <laughs> uh, well, 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 no. He says, your father lend you the car? Uh, yeah, yes. Well, you better get her back in quick. And he jumped in the car and away he went over the hill. And I looked at this driver. He says, those are the kind of friends you have. Well, I'm afraid that was the kind of friend I had that night. Never saw the fellow again. And you say, what an awful thing to do. But you see, what he did was, he scared him with his dad. And your man forgot about the fact it was the other fellow's fault. Now, I am not commending him. <laughs> and there are a lot of police officers in here tonight. And I am in no way saying it's the right thing to do. But I'm only saying, it's nothing to do with me. I, I didn't do it. <laughs> but that's what he did. You know, when I got home, I, I was kind of reeling with it. 
well, it wasn't a bad accident, actually. Uh, I'll say that much, a few scripts, but uh, that's the way he did it. He didn't hit him head on, but he scared him. And you know, these fellas, all he had to say was, I'm going to tell your daddy. And then they were in trouble. Oh, yes, I forgive you, and I don't want the Egyptians to know, but I'm going to tell your father. And I know what you're thinking, wait till your father gets home, but you put it the other way around, wait till you get home to your father. But isn't it lovely? You know how we threaten people when we forgive them? Yes, I forgive you, but you wait until so-and-so hears about this. Yes? You hang it over their heads as a threat. And Joseph had that option. He had his fingertip on that option to scare them with their father, but he didn't, he didn't use it. Didn't use it. So it is, my friends, since God has forgiven us. Listen to the scripture. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Huh? He's not dangling it over our head and say, I forgive you in Calvary love, but I'm going to drag it up and I'm going to really have you for it one day. There is forgiveness for you, my friend. God says, leave the past to me. And he can make it all work together for good. You say, that is, that's incredible. That's not possible. It is possible because of what happened at Calvary. That's why we preach the cross. That's why we say, look, behold the Lamb of God, which beareth away the sin of the world. We say to you, flee to him and trust him, and your sins will be forgiven. His blood can cleanse. But notice, friends, this uh, little perspective on Joseph. Notice that it says in verse number one that Joseph wept aloud. Have you noticed in the story of Joseph how often he weeps? You remember when his brothers were having a conversation in his presence, chapter 42, verse 24. He turned about himself from them and wept and returned to them again and communed with them. 4224, that's when his brothers were having a conversation in his presence, and they didn't realize that he could understand Hebrew. He was talking in Egyptian. Didn't I tell you, Reuben was saying, didn't I tell you not to sin against that boy? But you wouldn't listen, and now we must give an account for his blood. And Joseph heard them talking, and the pain of the past memory of what they had done had got to him, and he wept. Notice chapter 43, verse number 30. It says, Joseph made haste, for he yearned within upon his brother, and he sought where to weep, and he entered into his own private room and wept there. That's his first encounter with his young brother Benjamin when he had returned from Canaan, and Joseph weeps in his private room. Notice chapter 45, verse number 2, where we are now. He weeps aloud in this given situation that we've been studying whenever he reveals himself. Then notice in verse 14 and 15 again of this very same passage, he falls upon his brother Benjamin's neck and weeps, and Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren and wept upon them, and after that his brethren talked with him. That's when they truly understood who he was. He burst out crying again. And then if you go to chapter 46, verse number 29, Joseph made ready his chariot, went up to meet Israel, his father, to Goshen, presented himself to him, fell on his neck, and wept on his neck for a good while. He weeps when he meets his father. Then notice chapter 50 and, and verse number 1. You have it again. And Joseph fell upon his father's face after his father had died, of course, and wept upon him and kissed him. His father had just died. And then after his father had died, his brothers were afraid Joseph might seek revenge, and they sent a message to their brother that their father requested Joseph, before he died, to forgive them for what they had done against him. 
And when their message came that their father had given before he had died, don't do anything to your brothers because of what they've done to you, Joseph weeps. It's 50 in verse number 17. So shall we say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. They did to thee this evil. Now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. What do these instances tell us of Joseph? Well, very quickly, the first one tells us he wept because the pain of the past got to him. And if he had been bitter and angry against them, he would have rejoiced over the predicament that they were in, but he didn't rejoice over it and say, ha ha, I've got you now. He wept. That shows the kind of heart he is. His tears proved the kind of man he was. And there was no smirking and no laughing. He cried, and it said an awful lot about him. And in the second instance, he wept because he's reunited with Benjamin. He didn't say, walk up to Benjamin and say, I hope you can stick these brothers of yours because look what they did to me when I was young. No, he said to Benjamin, God be gracious to you, my son. In the third instance, he wept because he saw his brother's true repentance. And when he saw that Judah, who was the fellow who suggested to sell him in the first place, when he saw he had repented, it moved him that his older brother had repented and was taking responsibility for his old father and his young brother, and it moved him, and he wept. And in the fifth and sixth instances, he wept because he was reunited with his father, which is a common thing. If been away from home, you would weep when you came home. For a long time, you'd be glad to see your father again, and of course, we do all weep across the world when we lose our loved ones. Now, what does this all say? Well, Dr. DeHaan once calculated that of all the tears shed in the world could be barreled and poured into a canal, the waterway would stretch from New York to San Francisco. And he said that you could possibly um, put some barges on the river. They could be floated in the canal of tears to stretch right across the U.S., and I reckon few would doubt him if all the tears of the world had been bottled and poured into a river. But remember that God created human beings with the capacity to weep. It is one of the most important capacities that a human being has, the ability to weep. And people, research shows, who when they lose their loved ones, who do not allow themselves to weep, at some point in time, they are probably headed for a future emotional struggles. We do not believe in the heathen philosophy of stoicism, of the stiff upper lip and you don't weep whenever things happen to you. This story proves it. Jesus wept. Weeping is not necessarily a sign of weakness. It can be a mark of great strength when a man weeps. You couldn't call Joseph a weakling, could you? Though he stood up against the seductress like Pharaoh's wife is not weak. I tell you, he's not weak. Fellow who could govern all of Egypt is not weak. And yet again and again and again through this story, he cries. It wasn't a sign of weakness. It was a sign of strength. There's a time and a place to weep, you know. He could have allowed himself earlier to burst out into tears, but he refrained. He didn't lose control of the, his emotions. And then when the time came after he had found out his brothers had truly repented, then he wept. And he didn't use weeping as a, a means of manipulation. Some people are very good at that. Little children are smashing at it. But when they grow up a little older, it's pathetic to see some people use weeping as a means of manipulation. And whether it's a man or whether it's a woman who uses it, it's not right, it's wrong. And some people are very good at developing the art of weeping to shove and manipulate their way into people's emotions and to wreck lives. Don't trust everyone who weeps. But weeping from a pure motivation often clears the way 
for objective communication, because in chapter 45, verse 15, as soon as Joseph had wept, in verse 14, he fell on Benjamin's neck and wept. Notice what happened in verse 15. After that, his brethren talked with him. His tears broke the situation, and it drew them closer to him. And sometimes when you have a good weep, and maybe you've had a row, or maybe you've had a problem, and you felt like weeping, why did you hold back, friend? You weep. I remember one night I was in a situation that a lot of Christians had really ganged up on me, and they were slaying me with their tongues, and it was getting hot and heavy. And I couldn't take it anymore. I just bowed my head and wept. And they were a little easier on me after I wept. And a friend who was with me that night, you know, he came out and he said, Derek, I'm sorry, boy. He said, if I had it to do over again, he said, I'd have put my arm around you when you wept and took you out. Some Christians can be very cruel, you know. Very cruel. And I find that God broke me that night and wept. And I felt a fool. And I went out of that place after I'd been given that really rough ride. And I came out of it and I thought, Lord, I, I, I can't go on serving you anymore. I got a real blitz even at the very beginning of my ministry. Sometimes people, Christians, can be far harder on you, you know, than the unconverted can. They really destroy you emotionally. I reckon I'm not the first fellow to weep in this crowd. Maybe I'm looking into your face tonight and you've been weeping today, sir. Where nobody saw you. Maybe it would have been a good job if they had seen you. I've been moved at men who have told me that as we have worshipped at the end of these services, they have wept. And I find that very moving as God has touched their heart through the word. Don't be afraid of your tears, my friend. They come from a pure motivation. Look at this lovely man, one of the strongest men in all history. But he wasn't ashamed to weep. I think we could do with a bit more weeping, don't you? And less slickness and cleverness and pride. And I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread syndrome. And aren't you privileged to listen to me? No. There used to be a young Presbyterian preacher in Scotland called Robert Murray McShane. He died when he was 29 of TB. He only preached in public for seven years. And he made such a mark in seven years that he's never been forgotten. I've been to the place where he preached. You have a look at the visitor's book in Dundee. It's incredible. Even people still going there, even to try and catch something of the spirit of the man almost. Young fellow, died at 29. He's buried just along the wall of the church building. A man said after he had died, he said, you see that fellow McShane, the very way he walked into the pulpit sorely affected me. It is said of Torrey, the great revivalist, when he walked into a factory floor, the people working in the factory would break down and weep because of the godliness of the man. And somebody went to McShane's building after he had died, you know, the church building, and here's somebody else, and they said to the sexton of that place, sit down, what was the secret of that young fellow's preaching? And here I have to hang my head in shame. Or it hurts, but it was true. Maybe this was the secret of his power. The sexton said, uh, do you want to see the secret of his power? This is a true story. He said, come with me. And he took him into the pulpit. Now, they have McShane's pulpit still in that building. I've been in it. They've got it preserved in a back room. But he took him into his pulpit. It was still standing in the church building at that time. He says, now stand where McShane stood. So he stood in the pulpit. Now he said, sir, cry until that cushion there holding up the Bible is soaking. Now, sir, cry until there is almost a pool of tears are in your feet. Huh?
weeping. No sign of weakness. I remember that lovely, godly Presbyterian minister, Mr. Nixon, up in Bestbrook, when my friend John McConville was murdered and what eight other men with him in that bus on that infamous night. And five coffins out of his congregation were rowed up in front of his pulpit. And that minister got up to speak, and there were cameras there from Holland and the U.S. and you name it, filming that moment. And he got up. And I remember other boys said some things that day, but the minister got up, and he broke down and wept. He wept. And quite frankly, it was one of the most moving moments I have ever been through. He didn't say much, but I tell you, he said a whole lot. He cared. It had moved him. All these murders that are happening every day, it doesn't move us now. Fuck, it's just blood on the road there. We see it every night at six o'clock and seen around six or whatever. I sure have seen that before. It doesn't move us. Time was in Ireland when one death would have virtually stopped the whole country. It doesn't stop us now. Don't weep anymore. Got used to it. Hmm? Oh, Joseph, the man who wept. But weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Get away home, fellas, and tell your dad about it. Hmm? And look, on the way, you're forgiven men, right? What right have we to go and tell our father about this? Look what we have done. No. You go home. You're forgiven. And you say, what right have I to go out to Ulster these days and tell others? I'm a sinner. But if you're a forgiven sinner, then God will give you power to tell other beggars where to find bread because you're only a beggar yourself telling other beggars where to find it. Forgiven. And a whole lot of us have our tongues tied and we won't speak out a word for the Lord because we feel so guilty about our past. Oh, away with it. You are forgiven. Go home and tell your father of all my glory in Egypt. Go to it, fellas. And uh, when you're passing on the good news, passing on the good news, it'll not make you any better than any other man. That's true, but you are forgiven men. And please, when you're heading home to do it, don't quarrel. That's almost a wry little word of his. Now, don't be fighting, boys, as you go home to do it. See Christians in this land? Very good at fighting each other. You say, are they really? Yes, they are really. You send them to a work. Let's have a mission. Let's have something. Sit down to think it through. Oh my goodness, you're not into it for five minutes before. Well, I think we should do this. And I think we should do, no, no, we'll not have him. No. Yes, him. No, no, not him. Yeah, somebody, oh, maybe him, yeah. Well, you know. Well, well, he wouldn't suit. No, no, no. Yeah, I, I, that's my man or woman or whatever. I, I, I think we should form a committee to do this. Committees. <laughs> committees. Ha, ah, committees. Committees are things, you know, a camel is a horse designed by a committee. Let's have a whole lot of committees to do this. Hmm? John the Baptist have a committee, did he? Well, I'm sure committees have their place. Not much, but they have their place. <laughs> Moses have a committee. Moses had a committee. The children of Israel would still have been on the other side of the Red Sea. And I'm serious. We all quarrel, don't we? We have to suit him and we have to suit her and we have to suit them. We're trying to suit everybody! And we're getting nowhere. And the land is revivalless. And the churches are empty, trying to please everybody. Oh, what a word is needed. What a word is needed. Don't quarrel on the way. Cut out your fighting and go home 
and tell your father of all my glory. But don't argue about it. Don't argue about it. Why, said Stuart Driscoll once, would I allow people to clap their hands in church services? Well, it might be very dangerous to let them clap their hands in church services. You're awful quiet for a minute. Why? Because you say, oh, this is controversial. Well, this is what Stuart said. He said, the difficulty of letting people clap their hands in services is, you see, that uh, they'd all clap their hands during the services and praise the Lord, but then they would divide before long because some boys would think it was more spiritual to clap with their right hand <laughs> on their left hand because your right hand is your strength. See, it's on my right arm, you know, right hand, yes, and they give you Bible verses for it. The right hand's the thing to use. Ah, so uh, then the other, the left-hand clappers, they come up and they say, no, 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 we think it's the left hand you should clap with. You say, ridiculous, huh? And then they form two denominations known as the right-hand clappers and the left-hand clappers. <laughs> and they get a moderator of it, and then they have international breakfasts, and then they have local breakfasts and presidential breakfasts, and who are they? They're the right-hand or left-hand clappers. You say you're being frivolous, Derek. My friends, churches have split over far less than that. Churches have divided over, she said this about me, and she's not going to do it. See what happens? Things that aren't the biggest issues in the world become huge issues in the devil's hands. And the church splits. And when the devil's got us, got us all split up into all little areas, what happens? The gospel doesn't go out, and they don't hear of all his glory in heaven. And they don't hear about a Savior who can save. And they don't hear about the gospel of Christ. What do they hear about? They hear arguments about whether you should clap your hands or not. Don't quarrel. Get the news home. And there's something lovely here, friends. And just give me a minute to get this out because it's very precious. It's fantastic. Yeah. They come home to their old dad, and they obviously haven't quarreled along the way for a change because they've been quarreling for years, and you know what they were up to. They come home with the news. And as they come home, you know, suddenly they begin to tell their father about what happened. Now, I don't know how long it took, uh, but uh, they said, Joseph is yet alive, and he's governor of all the land of Egypt. Seems to me maybe they maybe did it right away. Now, you've got to remember, it's 22 years now since Jacob has seen his son. And he had seen the blood-soaked soaked, soaked coat. And he had said, ah, that blood-soaked coat means my son is dead. And he went into depression for 22 years that he hadn't recovered from. That's what I think that coat means. It's got to be. There's no other reason for it. Look at it. And maybe years ago you saw something and you said, that's the way it is, that's the way it is. God hasn't really answered my prayer and I'm in trouble now and that's it and that's the way the circumstance was and there's no hope for me and you're in depression for years and held in a cage for years. And you say, oh, Mr. Preacher, I am out of the will of God but I'd give a million pounds to know that I was in it. Did you not realize, friend, if you ask anything according to his will, he hears you? And you might have asked 22 years ago for it, and God hasn't yet answered it, but that doesn't mean to say he's not going to. God answers every prayer, and he'll answer it sooner or later. But you've given up. That blood so so coat means that Joseph is dead. And I won't believe anything else, but look, he's not dead. He's alive. And the Lord is about to... No, not at all. And one of these days, folks... That prayer you prayed six months ago or last year and you've forgotten all about it and tonight you're weary and depressed and down. You say, oh, Lord's forgotten all about me and I'm so sinful and I'm so miserable and I'm so wrong. One of these days you're going to blush. You're going to blush. I've been looking for a long time to get onto satellite to get the word across Europe because the Muslims are bang up all the airtime on the satellites that's going through cable television into Europe, millions. They're bang up all the airtime. In Manchester, they've bought it all up. 
and British law says we've got to have so many hours in satellite for religious broadcasting every week, so they buy it all up. And I say, Lord, how could we get up onto that thing? Huh? How would we get the word and preach it and get Christians together and get a message out that could pour into Oslo and Hamburg and, and Europe? Yeah? I don't have the money for it. Even the Christian station that there is, there's a fella in, in, in Norway, you know, the Norwegian government didn't want to buy any time on the satellite, so he bought it at 100,000 pounds. And he's putting out programs, and he put up Christian programs at 1,600 pounds an hour. Can you imagine how much it would cost to put me up there? <laughs> you know, seriously. Costs a lot of money even for, for ha that was half an hour's broadcasting, 1,600 pounds an hour. And if you were going on to the other one, the other one's astronomical. And I say, well, Lord, I, you know, I, I dearly love to do something about it, but there's nothing I can do. I can't afford it. I don't have it. And I'm praying about it. And I'm praying about it. Wondering about it. Longing for a thrust that we could move into new areas for God. So I go to Scotland Sunday morning, preaching. Smallish congregation. Comparison to this. Seemingly a very ordinary Sunday. Suddenly this fellow comes up to me a bit shy and tall. and he says, hey, Derek, he says, uh, I want to show you this. Yeah, he's going to show me this. Well, it's very interesting, yes. What's this? He says, uh, there is a channel up there, he says, on the communication satellite, he said, um, and uh, there's an organization, they're looking for uh, religious programs. Mm -hmm. Are they? And they can't get them. Oh, now this fellow had just been videoing me in that service from, a, from a, an organization there in Scotland, and he said, uh, we, um, we're we're very exercised about this uh, going onto this satellite. I said, yeah. He says, um, you see these people, he said, who have this, who have to put religious programs on it, they'd pay us to do it. I said, oh, what? <laughs> they'd pay us to do it, would they? Oh, they would. And he said, the lady who's involved with us is selling her house to buy the equipment. I said, uh, is she? <laughs> yes. And, and uh, well, like, when do you think we should get going? Well, he virtually said this afternoon. And that church got together with an elderhood within an hour. And I can tell you those boys are burning rubber to get on that satellite. And we shall be going soon, God willing, across there to get the word out to millions. And I'm saying, Lord, where will it come from? And how will we do it? And we haven't got it. And all the time, God is moving a woman's heart and people's heart to buy the equipment to get it to television standard to get it out. Now, we're not there yet. But I want you to pray. I want you to pray that not only will we get there, but that it will be an opening of a whole new day for us. That we shall launch from these islands right across Europe with the word. You say that's a fairy tale. Hmm. It's no more a fairy tale than when those boys came home to Joseph. Huh? Came home to Jacob and said to Jacob, He's alive. Don't believe he's alive. Haven't thought he's alive. And you say, I have things that I've been praying about and there's no answer. How do you know that some woman isn't selling her house to answer it? Huh? Could be. Happened tonight. Can come from any area. In fact, he was so surprised whenever they told him the story of Joseph that he fainted. And maybe one of these days when God answers your prayer, you say, but, but an insignificant person like me, that's exactly how I felt. I, in a sense, I came home on the plane early Monday morning and I didn't know whether I was up or down or around. I said, did that really happen to me yesterday, Lord? Or am I dreaming? All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to fear beside? And next week, one of our elders will tell you how God has called him to full-time service at 60 years of age in these meetings on Joseph. 
God's been speaking to him. He's about to launch out. At 60, here's an age to give his life to winning men for Christ. You come and hear him, because it'll be very moving. And God is not going to the U.S. or necessarily going on to satellites or all that big-time thing. He just wants to take people like you and me, you and your small corner and I and mine, insignificant, sinful, self-centered people that God has saved and forgiven and cleansed. And fellas and girls, the world is your parish. Go to it for Christ. There's no telling what he'll do with you. And notice the Bible says they told him all the words of Joseph. And I learned something today. It seems to me that whenever they did that, they, they told him, they told Jacob that it was their fault. They confessed. Because, of course, we'll see that Jacob's spirit was moved when he saw the wagons and up he got and away he went. But it seems to me when they told him all the words of Joseph uh, that that would include the fact that Joseph had actually said earlier, you sold me, but God sent me. So if they told their father all the words of Joseph, they must have put that sentence in. So they would have to say, Dad, we sold him. Every detail of Scripture is important. They told him all the words of Joseph. All. He was having to bid farewell, you know, to an old lifestyle. This man is 130 now. That's getting on, I'm telling you. He has to leave it. He has to leave Canaan forever. Think it's easy for a man at 130 to get up and leave everything? And anyway, didn't God say to his grandfather, I'll give you Canaan? His grandfather Abram, I'll give you Canaan. What's God saying to me, go to Egypt for? Hey, what's this? Leave Canaan at 130? When God said to my grandfather, he would give us Canaan for ourselves? We're all opposed to change, aren't we? And if that old fella had been opposed to change, he'd have missed the blessing. He'd say, no, I'm not going. I don't see it. No, it's not right. I don't want to change it my time. No, this is the way I've been for 130 years, and we've done it this way, and we're always going to do it this way, and that's it. <laughs> and don't you dare talk about change in any form or any um, corner. I'm not going. I'm sitting here. He'd have missed it. And that's why a whole lot of churches are as dead as Hector, although in the town I used to live, you don't say as dead as Hector, because Hector was the liveliest Christian in it. <laughs> and probably still is. But that's why a whole lot of churches are as dead as, as dead as Hector, because they are cold and lifeless and largely ineffective, because we're not going to change. No, we're not going to change. And backsliders, they're the same. They're away from the Lord. They trusted him, and they had an idea of God. And they say, well, I've seen the coat, and that's the way it is. And I won't listen to anything else, and God could never use me. And they miss it. God says, come on. Come near to me, and come on out of where you are. I've got great things for you. Come on. You've waited long. Now come. Come on, Jacob. 22 years are up now. And you'll notice in all of those 22 years, folks, he had no special experiences from God. In all those years, he, 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 he assumed the wrong thing out of the will of God, and he couldn't be comforted even though his men tried or his, his sons tried to comfort him. He hadn't got a special experience from God. But now, you know, this was the man who used to sleep, and the ladder went from his, his pillow right up to heaven. Now, fantastic. And he hasn't had any experiences like that for 22 years. But no sooner does he step out at God's word and head away out into the new land, taking his journey, chapter 46, and all that he had, verse 1. He's offering sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac, and God spoke to him and said, Jacob, Jacob, 
Oh, there it is. Hey, when you get going for God, then God compensates you. And he says, here I am. He said, I am God, the God of your father. Don't fear to go down into Egypt. I'll make of you a great nation. I'll go with you, verse 4, into Egypt. I'll also bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Oh, special blessing from God. When he stepped out, would you notice a wee thing in chapter 28, verse 15, as we close? You say, honestly? Yes, honestly. 28, 15. You remember way back there when the ladder went up from his pillow to heaven? God gave him a promise, the vision of Jacob's ladder. Verse 15, very quickly. Behold, says God, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. <laughs> now get that wee word again. What does it mean? I'm sure all his life he wondered it. God, what, what, what does that mean? I'm with you in all the place where you go and I'll bring you again into this land. I'll not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. How could God bring him into the land again if he didn't leave it in the first place? <laughs> and 22 years later, God says, come on, down into Egypt. Oh, Egypt. Well, what about the promise to Canaan that we'll have Canaan? I, I, I said, I will bring thee again into the land of Canaan. And God did bring him again into the land of Canaan. His body was brought back. And then one day after a long and weary journey, the children of Israel returned to the land of Canaan, out of Egypt. He would have to go out to get back. And in a very real sense, when we see even the rows that are going on in Jerusalem at the moment between the orthodox ones and the ones that aren't so orthodox and whatever. <laughs> and they're still preserving their land and that, that passion they have for Israel and for Jerusalem as the capital. There they are still, no matter what Hitler did or anybody else. God kept his promises. I will bring thee again into the land. Come on, move on, Jacob. It's a big step. I'll be with you. And maybe before I see your face next week, God will call you to move on. You may pass through death. Somebody else may die before next week. Be in his presence. He'll be with you. It'll be new. He'll ask you to move on. Or maybe this week God will call you out of your job and move you to another job. Or maybe this week God will take you out of Ireland and put you to another place that you never imagined and you wanted Canaan and he gave you Egypt. <laughs> and Joseph keeps his word. He said, now, fellas, whenever they all came down and whenever they got down, whenever you go in before Pharaoh, we'll ask you what you are. Don't be ashamed to tell them you're shepherds. Stick by what you are. Don't be ashamed of it. And I tell you, Whatever your step of faith and whatever situation you're in, don't be ashamed of where you are and what God has done with you. Stand with it. Should the whole world be against you? Those satellites are but flies with him. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. He'll meet your every need as I have found to the very shoes on your feet and the very food in your stomach and he'll never fail you nor forsake you. It's a promise, friend. And you're fiddling about with the devil in the world and thinking you're being satisfied. Oh, friend, God, like Joseph, keeps his word. And it may mean change and a change of lifestyle and a change of circumstance. But when he went and got into Goshen, was he glad?